verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I will be reading from the New King James. The heading is, What was heard, seen, and touched. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Pastor Westgate. Well, good morning. Good morning. I messed up my AV guy. I didn't turn my mic on. Happy Sabbath. Sorry, John. He's freaking out. <laughs> well, I want to start today by reminding you to do something. Okay? And the thing that I want you to do is I want you to be praying for one another. Amen. Praying for one another. I've realized um, today um, in church, out of church, in this country, in our world today, that people are praying on one another and not praying for one another. Have you noticed that? Yes. That, that there's a lot of people that are praying on other people, right? Um, because they don't think like I do, dress like I do, eat like I do, believe like We pray on them instead of praying for them. And so I want you to encourage, encourage one another around you by praying for one another. I can tell you that um, there's probably, uh, let me do it like this. How many of you in here would love to know that your church family is praying for you? How many of you would love to know that? Yeah, see? Because we need that, right? There's, there's a song that we used to sing called, and it, was, it, it went like this. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. How's the rest of that go? Standing in the need of prayer. Standing in the need of prayer. And we all need it today. Right? I need it. You need it. Our families need it. Our, our community needs it. Our nation, our world needs it. See? And so I, I want you to begin deliberately and intentionally praying for one another. Amen. Praying for one another. Because I can tell you, things happen when we pray. Have you noticed that in your life? That when you pray, the Lord moves? That he does something? And, and I've, I've seen it time and again. I can tell you that I've been praying specifically. Our, our church has, if you're, if you're First time visiting with us today, I can tell you our church has, has sort of launched a new directive for, for our church here. And that is that we're going to be very intentional, not only about praying for one another and strengthening the bonds of unity that have been, frankly, challenged of late because of a number of things, politics and COVID and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, but we're going to be very intentional about praying for and then reaching out to those people who have names uh, on the books of this church, members of this church, who haven't been here, some of them, for quite some time. Um, I've been pastor of this church for 10 years, and some of the folks whose names are on the books of this church, I've never met. I, I may have met them in Plyler's or Walmart. I bumped into I didn't know them, but, but, um, but some of you know them. And some of you, even as I'm saying this, are thinking, you know, I haven't seen so-and-so for a while. It's been a minute since, since, since they've been here. Since they've come to worship. And I know COVID, right? I get that. We have a lot of folks worshiping with us on Zoom today. Um, and some of that is related to COVID. They're, they're, they don't want to come here because either they're sick or they know someone's sick or they're being cautious. I get that. And that's okay. All right? But I'm talking about pre-COVID, right? But there's been some folks that have been missing for a minute, as we say around here. And so we're going to be intentional about seeking them out. And I want you to begin... In your own mind, in your own heart, and maybe with a pen and a piece of paper, I want you to begin writing down names. I'm going to have the church clerk print up a membership list. Okay, I have one at home. I pray over that membership list. I pray for people I haven't met before. Okay, If their name's on the list, I pray for them, and I just have to give them to the Lord. I don't know what's going on in their lives. I, I, some of them live out of state. They're still members of this church. I pray for them Okay, and ask the Lord to move in their life, move on their hearts, right? Because that's... That's the best I can do, is to pray them and put them before the Lord. Uh, for those of you I know, I pray specific prayers for you, for your family, for, for your job situation, whatever it is that you're dealing with. I, I pray for you. We, we need to be praying for each other, right? And so I want you to begin to make a list in your mind, in your heart, on a piece of paper, whatever works for you, of those people that you've been missing here, okay? And I want you to start praying for them. 
Yeah, we're going to organize. We're going to meet together. We're going to have a few workshops on how to, how to go knock on a door, how to, how to say hi to a church member. Maybe that you used to have a relationship with don't anymore, or maybe somebody that's a member of this church that you haven't ever met before. We're going to talk about those things, okay? And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to be sincere, and we're going to be intentional about trying to reacquaint ourselves with them and they with us in the, in the hope, right? The ultimate hope is that they'll join us again for fellowship and for worship, okay? But it starts with us praying. Praying isn't the least we can do, it's the most we can do, right? I hear sometimes people say that, well, at least we can pray. No, praying is an amazing thing, see? Because prayer moves God's heart, see? And so we need to be praying for one another. And so I encourage you to make a list, to begin praying over that list, to lift them up to the Lord. Because as we reach out to them, as we sow seeds of love and sow seeds of fellowship and sow seeds of mercy, we want them to land on good soil, right? We don't want them to land on a hard heart. We want one that's, that's softened by the influence of the Holy Spirit. And as you pray for them, the Holy Spirit is able to do those things. So we're going to be praying, intentional, seeking those folks out. It begins with prayer. We'll end with prayer, um, but it's going to begin with prayer. Um, the other thing I want you to realize, too, is this, is that as we're praying for one another and praying for them, that the Lord will organize divine appointments. You guys know what those are? Divine appointments. We're going to talk about those in a few minutes. Uh, but today, we, we need to jump in here. We're going to attempt to answer a question that's, that I think is a really good starting place, a jumping off point, if you will, uh, for this path that we've chosen to walk down together. But let's pray together as we open up scripture together. Let's, let's pray. Father, we, uh, we just thank you for being the kind and gracious and loving God that scripture declares you to be. We have seen that in our own lives, experienced that time and again. And we, and we ask, Lord, today, as we spend some time with an open Bible, that you would speak to us from the word, that you would, Father, remind us of your compassion for people, that you would remind us, Father, of our experience with you. Help us, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember one of the many lessons my mother endeavored to teach her seven children, because um, I'm number six out of seven kids. And I remember my mother was busy most of the time. Um, she was either washing clothes or hanging clothes on the line. My mom hangs clothes on the clothesline still today at 83 and a half. Um, she still hangs the clothes out. She'll hang them out when it's freezing and they will literally get stiff. <laughs> okay. That's what she does. Okay. She just, that's part of her routine. And, and I remember one of the lessons my mom tried to teach us. And, and the essence of the lesson was if you hang out with sketchy people, people are going to think you're a sketchy person. Now, I don't know that my mom used the word sketchy. I don't know in all of her 83 and a half years if she's ever used the word sketchy. But what my mom said was really the same thing. What she said was birds of a feather flock together. And I got that. And I understood what she was saying. And yet, even though she said that, it was difficult for me, maybe it was challenging for you too, to choose friends. It's, it's, it seems like friendship happens by attrition sometimes. People choose you, right? They pull you into their group, right? And, and maybe it's because of some common thing that happened, right? That intentionally and purposefully seeking out and establishing friendships with someone can be work. But these natural things that happen, right? Like I, I remember my, my friend James, he's still a good friend of mine. We met in first grade on the playground. It was the first recess of first grade and we were seesawing together and I didn't know him and he didn't know me but we got on the same seesaw and James got bored, ADD probably and I was up and these were the big long 2 by 12 wooden nice seat that are illegal now I guess on playgrounds, I don't know, probably kids get hurt um, he was down, I was up he jumped off <laughs> and I went down in a hurry and cried like only a first grader can cry, okay and the teacher came and asked what happened, and I had to point him out, and she made him sit on the wall, and, you know, it was all of this, and, and we became best friends after that because we had a shared experience, see? And maybe your shared experience was maybe you were in the cafeteria in one of those public schools, and they, and they served hamburgers, and everybody pulled off the bun at the same time and says this. I don't know what this is, but it's not a hamburger, right? And you bonded over that. Whatever it was, you, you, you develop those friendships and those fellowships based on some sort of shared experience. Maybe you went to the same revival meeting together. 
Maybe you went on the same mission trip together. And you bonded and connected over those shared experiences. Maybe you just rode a roller coaster once with your friend after having eaten way too much food. And you both had the same experience after that. And you connected over this weird thing. And you have fellowship with them because of that. Fellowship, community. I, I can tell you, those things are important. It's important to have fellowship in your life. It's important to have community in your life. And I think that's why depression rates are so high right now and anxiety levels are through the roof right now that suicides, unfortunately, are, are about the highest they've ever been because of this social distancing thing that's going on, because of this pandemic. You develop friendships that give you a sense of fellowship. We like to be around people who like us. When people laugh at our jokes, we gravitate towards them. When people treat us with kindness and respect, we gravitate toward them because we feel included, because we feel like we're part of the group. We feel well inside that community. People who think like we think and enjoy what we enjoy, who value the things that we value. Some could ask, why is it so important to connect with each other and with those missing members? Because they were once part of this fellowship. They were once part of this community. At one time, they made the same profession of faith that you did, and they became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. These aren't people that are totally disconnected. I mean, maybe they are now because of time and distance. Maybe they've been holding on to something. I don't know what it is. But the reality is at one time, they were part of this fellowship. What would it be like, suppose... If you skip church one week, anybody ever skip church? I know you don't want to raise your hand and say that. <laughs> oh, yeah. What would it be like if you skipped church and nobody reached out and said, hey, man, I missed you. I missed you at church. It sure would be easy the next week to skip church, wouldn't it? And then after you skip church for a full solid month and nobody reaches out. And nobody drops a card in the mail or sends you a bulletin and says, hey, man, you, you missed something special. If, if nobody reaches out after a month, and then you miss for another month, and nobody from that fellowship reaches out, you would be, might begin to think that they didn't really care about you. That they really didn't have an interest in you. They, they may say that when you're together, but obviously when you're not together, maybe they... Maybe they never cared to begin with. And see, Satan begins to plant seeds of doubt. He, began to plant, he, he begins to plant thoughts of divisiveness. And after a while, you find other things to do with your Saturday morning and afternoon than go and worship with a bunch of people who don't care about you. Do you see how that can happen so easily? Yeah. Scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 that we're not to forsake this gathering together. That, that, we, that we need to continue to gather together. But what's the point? Why gather together in the first place? What is this fellowship really all about? What is it that unites us? It's, it's certainly not politics that unites us. It's certainly not an opinion about a mask that, divide, that, that unites us because those things today are dividing. But in 1 John, you've got your Bible, I hope you brought it today. It's just four verses we're going to look at today. First John chapter 1. It's not the gospel of John. It's that little letter. It's one of those three letters. If you start in Revelation and go backwards, you'll probably run into it quicker. Revelation, Jude, 3rd, 2nd, 1st John, if you're going backwards, okay? And we're just going to look at these first four verses in the first chapter. Because John lays out a simple truth here. Really what he says, um, he says that what he has told people, the things that he has written, the things that he has told people, things that he has shared, have been the very things that he experienced. Things that he saw, things that he heard, things that he touched, that his hands laid hold of, right? And, and really, that's John's testimony. John says that he shares his testimony for a reason. And by the way, you have a testimony. Each one of you in here, if you've had an experience with Jesus Christ, if at some point in your life you said yes to Jesus, you have a testimony. I always tell people that everybody has one sermon in them, and it's their testimony. It's, their, it's your testimony. You have a story regarding your experience with Jesus, what you have heard, what you have seen, what, what, what Jesus has done in your life. Maybe your testimony is that you were born and raised into this fellowship. You've done the best you can to remain in this fellowship, and by God's grace, you really haven't strayed that much. I wish that was my testimony. It's not. 
I wish it was. I, I, I talk to people like that. They say, Pastor, I don't have a testimony. And they tell me that testimony. <laughs> and I think that's got to be the most powerful testimony I've ever heard. Maybe your testimony is different. Maybe it includes some moments where Jesus had to get your attention. Where Jesus had to pull you out of the pit. Maybe if your experience is like mine, you might have some moments where Jesus had to take some of that muck that you had created and smash it into your face and get it into your eyes so that you can actually see the mess you've made of things. Maybe you've had that experience. Your testimony, though, however it is, is uniquely your experience with Jesus Christ. It's unique to you, and only you can share it. I've heard people try to share other people's testimonies, and it just, it just doesn't resonate that well. Because it's yours, and you need to share it. This little passage we're about to read in 1 John, it, it may reveal to you just what you're supposed to do with your testimony. And what your purpose is as someone who has entered a relationship with Jesus. Look what he says, 1 John 1, 1. Are you there with me? Yes? yes? You guys are quiet today. Thank you, Tremika. Yeah. Look what he says. New King James. Yours might read a little different. It's okay. Don't, don't panic. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. Now, let me ask you a question. What's he talking about when he says the word of life? What is that? That's Christ. That's Jesus. Thank you, Marcus. Yes. He's talking about Jesus. So let's back up here a minute. We're going to reread what we just read because his focus here is Jesus. Okay? He's focusing on Jesus. Now let's start over. Let's remember that. This is about Jesus. That which was from the beginning. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus existed from when? From the beginning. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. That life was manifested. He's saying, look, he's saying probably in about as plain way as you can say it. That Jesus existed with the Father prior to his birth, and he became a man. He was manifested. See? He was manifested. And I saw him. I heard him. See? I, I laid hands on him. I laid my head on his chest at the Last Supper. I, I know him. That's what he said. Heard him speak. Saw him heal people. And he continues in verse 2. We have seen and we bear witness and we declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested to us. He's saying, look, Jesus existed and now he was with us. He, he's been manifested to us. And in verse 3, he says, and that which what we have seen and heard, we what? What does your say? Declare. We're declaring. See? We're declaring it to you. John says, look, I share my testimony. It's my very own. It's things that I saw, what, what I heard, what I experienced in my relationship with Jesus. That's what I write about. The Gospel of John is his own experience with Jesus. You have a gospel in you. You have a gospel in you about Jesus. The gospel according to Lex. The gospel according to Doreen. The gospel according to Jerry. You've got that in you. It's your experience with Jesus. What you have seen, what you have heard, what Jesus has done for you, how he has healed you, established you, given you time and chances again and again and again, the times that you blew it and the time Jesus came to your rescue. You've got that. You've got that testimony. The first thing I want you to remember today is this. Your testimony is yours. Uniquely yours. It was given to you by God and it was given for the purpose of sharing with other people. See? This is the purpose of your testimony. It's to share it with other people. So point number one, your unique testimony given to you by God is unique to you. And testimonies are made for sharing. For sharing. But for what purpose? Well, let me give you a helpful tip here, by the way. I remember when I first started sharing my testimony, I would go on and on and on about all the evil, heinous things I did. And there were a lot of them. Okay? And, and I, would, I would focus on that part. When it came to the part about Jesus actually rescuing me from the pit, and he did, and I praise the Lord that he did, that part got very little airtime. It, it was almost as though I was the hero of my own testimony. And I can tell you, if you're giving a testimony and Jesus isn't the hero, you're doing it wrong. 
Did you hear what I said? Jesus is the focus. He is the hero. You're not. Okay? So remember that. When you're sharing your testimony, it needs to be about Jesus, not about you. How good Jesus is, not how bad you are. Your testimony is about Jesus, not about you. It's not about you. Get out of the way. Let Jesus speak. I was young and prideful back then. I've learned a couple of things since then. The Lord is still working on me. But it doesn't matter how bad you are. It's how good Jesus is. And yes, sharing about your sinfulness, sharing about those details can be helpful. Because somebody else may be going through that same thing right then. They may be down in the pit. They may be knee deep in it, playing around in it, thinking it's no big deal. Holding on to that little three pound thing as though it's no big deal. They've adjusted their life to it, to the pain, to the discomfort. And hearing you speak about overcoming those things because of Christ gives them hope. So yeah, share the dirt. But glorify Jesus, not you. God gets the glory. You know, if you're getting the glory, if Jesus isn't the epicenter, you're doing it wrong. Remember that. Remember that. Because for a Christian, Jesus has to be the epicenter. He must be. Notice here in 1 John, John says, look, let me, let me tell you what I saw. Let me tell you what I heard. Let me, let me tell you what, what I experienced with Jesus. And the reason that John says he shares his testimony and the reason that we need to share ours is given right here in verse 3. He says, That which we have seen and heard we declare, so that you also may have fellowship with us. See? You can have, and he says, Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so the purpose of sharing a testimony is fellowship. Fellowship. That's the purpose. John says, the reason I tell you everything I experienced with Jesus is so that you'll join me in fellowship with Jesus. See, I want you to experience the fellowship of Jesus Christ. I want you to be a follower of Jesus just like I am. See, that's John's whole point. That's the whole point of sharing a testimony is so that somebody will desire fellowship with you with Jesus. So that you can have the benefit of a personal relationship with Jesus like I have. So that your life can be shaped like Je by Jesus like my life has been shaped by Jesus. So that you can experience unconditional love and unconditional grace the way that I have. So that you can fall in love with Jesus like I have. So that you can accept the offer of salvation that Jesus has given you like I have. That's the point. That's the point of a that's the point of a testimony. This fellowship of believers. This, this group right here in, in Bonnerdale, Arkansas, this, this fellowship of believers, of Jesus lovers, we've experienced what it means to say yes to Jesus. And by the way, if you haven't ever done that in your life, if you haven't ever said yes, Jesus, I, I, I want to let go of my junk. And I want to come to you by faith. And I, I want you to be the Lord of my life. You can do that right now, by the way. All it takes is a yes. I, 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 want, to, I want to let go of all that stuff. And I just want to come to you. Okay? I just want you to be my God. I want you to rescue me the way I've heard you rescue other people. All you have to do is say yes. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. So, Listen. Um, when you say yes to Jesus, you'll begin to experience what it means to be actually free. You begin to experience a letting go of sin and, and a taking on of Jesus' love, of his mercy, of his compassion for you. And, and when you say yes to Jesus, you're really saying, Jesus, I need you to rescue me because I can't do it myself. I, I've, I've been entrenched in it so long, I'm used to it, but I'm done with that and I need, I need you to help me. Notice what John says here. I, I, you want to experience fellowship with Jesus. Look what he says. This is John chapter 1. 1 John 1, chapter 1, verse 4. And these things we write to you so that your what? Joy may be full. The Greek implies that it's so full it's overflowing. Okay? So that your joy is completely and utterly full to bursting. Okay? Now, I want that in my life. I don't know about you. That full to bursting joy. Don't you want that? I'll tell you, Christians ought to be the most joyful people on the planet. 
We should be. Because we know some stuff, right? We know how the book ends. See? We know some stuff about Jesus' love and mercy. We've received it. Maybe you need to be reminded about that, but you've received it. See? And that ought to bring you joy. It doesn't mean you're going to be happy every day. It doesn't mean that. Happiness can change based on all kinds of factors, what you have for breakfast and who said what to you in the parking lot. All those kinds of things can impact you. But that joy that comes through knowing that Jesus Christ has given you salvation because of his tender mercies and grace, that ought to fill your heart with joy every moment of every day. It just should. Salvation, John is saying, is really the basis for our fellowship. When we share our testimony, see, when we share our testimony with others, that, that's what some folks call witnessing, by the way, right? Witnessing. I, I think the reality is, is that some people are scared about talking to Christ with other people because they're afraid they're going to ask them a question they can't answer, right? They're, they're going to ask me something about Daniel 2 and 1844. You know how many people are going to ask you that? Probably none of them, <laughs> Probably none of them are going to ask you that, okay? But when you share your testimony and people ask you questions, guess what? You'll know the answers because it's your testimony. See? You don't have to share a Bible study about last day events and all those kinds of things. You just share them your experience about Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about what my Jesus has done for me. How he daily sustains me. How he helps me when I get in the pit. And sometimes I get in the pit... And I know it's the pit, and I jump in the pit anyway, but Jesus still rescues me from the pit because that's the kind of God he is, see? When, when, you, when you begin to witness like that, when you begin to share your testimony, you're really inviting people to become part of a fellowship, a fellowship of Jesus lovers, right? A fellowship of, of people who, who also are sharing their testimony. A fellowship of unique people, from different backgrounds, experiences, cultures, and all of those things. And Jesus is calling us into this fellowship. We call each other, we, we say it's a church family. It's a fellowship, right? He, he calls us into that. Why? Because we share this common bond, not of politics and mass and all. We share this common bond of salvation in Christ. Because we've said yes to Jesus and he's transformed our lives. And it knits us together in fellowship. The people you know, the people who live in your world, in your sphere of influence. God has placed you there because you have a testimony that you need to be sharing. You have a testimony that they need to hear. And I can tell you, if you want to grow a fellowship, this is how it grows. By followers of Jesus Christ sharing their testimony and inviting other people to join them in fellowship with Christ. That's how it grows. The, the glue that bonds our fellowship together is our shared experience of, of salvation in Jesus. And that alone should bring us joy. John says it makes our joy overflow. And so John isn't inviting us into some fellowship of doom and gloom. He's inviting us into a fellowship of joy. Into a fellowship of grace. Because when we're intentional about sharing our testimony, about sharing our experience and our love for Jesus with others, the Holy Spirit begins to do a work on minds and hearts. Now, I've shared my testimony a few times, and every time I share it, it's different. And you probably have experienced the same thing if you've had the, the boldness to actually share your testimony. It's different every time. Do you know why that is? Because when you're, in, when you're prayerfully Entering into a time of testimony sharing, the Holy Spirit will put words in your mouth that you didn't plan to say. Because the people listening to you need to hear those words. Paul shares his testimony about the Damascus Road experience in the book of Acts three times. It's different every time. Because he's addressing a different audience every time. Because the Holy Spirit is giving him different words to share with that audience that they need to hear so that they will choose to become part of the fellowship. That's why you don't have to pre-plan things. You don't have to write yourself notes. It's your testimony. Share it from your heart, from your experience, from your depths. Share it prayerfully and carefully. And the Lord will speak through you to them. And he'll reach their heart with a message that they need to hear. I can tell you, there's going to be people who are going to have to decide what to do with Jesus once you share your testimony. 
They're going to have to make a decision. What they're going to have to do with Jesus. Because if what you're telling me is true, if Jesus really did that in your life, I need that in my life. Could I possibly trust Jesus to do that for me? That's why we need to be praying for one another. <laughs> because someone in this fellowship, hopefully several of us, are going to have an opportunity to share their testimony this week. The Lord is going to orchestrate a divine appointment for you. You guys know what those are, divine appointments? That's what the Lord sets things up for you. See? Sets things up for you. Like you'll be pumping gas at the gas station, and there's somebody else that's pumping gas right next door, and you can talk about anything under the sun with them or nothing. That's a divine appointment. You know how I start those? I talk about the weather. You know why? Because everybody will talk to you about the weather. Oh, they will. Cold today. Yeah, it sure is. You know what my next line is? But isn't God good? And just like that, we're talking about something completely different. And God will give you those two or three minutes at the pump to share something with them that could change their eternal destiny. Divine appointments. You need to be praying for one another. That when the Lord sets you up with those divine appointments, that you'll be bold enough and humble enough to share your testimony from your depths. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. See? Let me tell you what Jesus has done. Keeping Jesus at the center and sharing from our depths, those conversations will lead people to a decision. They may not make a decision right there at the gas pump, but you've planted a seed, see? And if another one of us comes in contact with them somewhere else and we're faithful to do the same, another seed gets planted. And a little water gets added. And before long, faith starts shooting up. See? And that's how it works. I pray every day for our son. He's got a birthday tomorrow. He's going to be 34. <laughs> Crazy. Time goes by like that. We pray for him. See? And the way that that works, because it's frustrating sometimes, but... The way that it works is this, is that when, you're, when we pray for our son who lives in New York, we don't have daily contact with him, um, I, I pray for him because he's an atheist today, profess atheist today. I, I, I say today because praying tomorrow will be different. So, or today, so we pray for him. Well, what does that look like for me 2,000 miles away? Well, it looks like me praying for the Lord's people to do something. See? So, my son, out and about at Walmart, bumps into somebody who says, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to bump into you. Are you having a good day? Yeah. Isn't God good? Hmm. That person in Walmart is answering my prayer. When you do the same, you're answering someone else's prayer for their loved one, for their child. You have an opportunity, we each do, each day, to do something bold for Jesus Christ. I'm wondering today if there's someone in here who would be willing to stand up and say, I want the church to pray for me this week because I want God to give me an opportunity to share my testimony, to say something that's going to cause someone to think about Jesus, and I want my church family praying for me this week. Is that you? Stand up with me, if that's you. you. You want the church to pray for you because you're going to be bold enough this week to actually say something about Jesus Christ. Yeah. I, I want you to look around at one another. I want you to look around at one another because you need to know what you're praying, who you're praying for. I'm serious. You need to know who you're praying for. Look at those faces. Pray for them. Pray for them because, listen, if you're not used to doing it, it takes boldness. It does. It takes intentionality. You've got to say, you've got to say, Lord, I'm, maybe I've never done this before, but Lord, I need, you to, I need you to help me because I don't even know what to say. The Lord will give you the words to say. If you're bold enough to actually say yes to Jesus. While we're standing up together, maybe there's someone in here who who needs to say yes to Jesus. Maybe it's 
Maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you've never said, you know, Jesus, I really, I need you to help me. I've been carrying this three-pound thing that weighs a million pounds by now. And I need you to help me with it. I, I need you to take it from me. Maybe you did that a long time ago. And, and you got baptized and then, and then you went back and picked this thing up and you haven't let it go. And you're ready to actually let some stuff go today. If, if you need to either say yes to Jesus, maybe for the first time, or rekindle that first love, I, I want you to meet me down front here so I can say a special prayer for you. Okay? A special prayer for you. And we're going to sing our closing hymn. I'm going to walk down here in the front. And if you need that prayer in your life, recommittal prayer or a commitment prayer to Jesus for the first time. If you want to study for Baptist, meet me down in front of you, okay? We're going to sing our closing hymn. It's number five, no, it's number, sorry, 469. It's leaning on the everlasting arms. The only way we